Tonight at 10, Sir David Amos, the Conservative MP, has been stabbed to death during a constituency surgery. He'd been a member of Parliament in Essex for almost 40 years and leaves behind a wife and five children. Tonight, a 25-year-old man is in custody, held on suspicion of murder. This was a difficult incident, but our officers and paramedics from the East of England Ambulance Service work extremely hard to save Sir David. Tragically, he died at the scene. A counter-terrorism team will lead the investigation. The Prime Minister was one of many paying fulsome tribute to the backbencher. David was a man who believed passionately in this country and in its future. And we've, we've lost today a fine public servant and a much-loved friend and colleague. The shock and grief here in Westminster tonight. A politician killed just while doing his job, serving the people he loved to represent. We'll be live with the very latest at the scene in Essex, also tonight. PCR testing is suspended at a lab in the Midlands after tens of thousands of people were incorrectly told they didn't have COVID. And more moves by the government to ease supply shortages, but British hauliers are angry. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News channel, Pep Guardiola says Raheem Sterling isn't guaranteed game time at Manchester City after the England forward suggested he could move abroad if he didn't play more regularly. Good evening. The Conservative MP Sir David Amos has been stabbed to death while conducting a constituency surgery in Essex. A 25-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder. Sir David, who was 69, died from multiple wounds and a knife was recovered at the scene in a church in Lyon C. Counter-terrorism police are leading the investigation but they're keeping an open mind as to the possible motive. Boris Johnson has paid his own tribute, saying Sir David was one of the kindest, nicest, most gentle people in politics. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has asked all police forces to carry out urgent reviews of the security arrangements for MPs, and security at the Houses of Parliament will also be reviewed. Let's join now our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Sandvad, who's live in Leon C for us tonight. Daniel. Yes, Clive, tonight this town on the Thames estuary is at the centre of a counter-terrorism investigation. Just after midday, the Friday quiet was broken by the sounds of sirens and helicopters as police and paramedics rushed to the scene where the local MP had been stabbed. But despite their efforts, they were unable to save him. Forensics teams and firearms officers at the Methodist church where the local MP had been holding his fortnightly surgery. Before Sir David Amos's meeting with constituents was over, a man had stabbed him multiple times in front of his assistant and his PA. He died at the scene, leaving constituents and party colleagues bewildered and in shock. And it's so tragic. This is such a nice area. And for this to happen is... What can I say? Yeah, he was so nice people, person loved everyone and he was doing so brilliant job for all the local residents and everyone you know. what he said he meant it wasn't wishy-washy so you knew where you stood with him uh, and he didn't didn't suffer fools gladly he he would speak his mind uh, and often did at, at different meetings that he went to but he was 100 percent in supporting south end and the residents of south end Will my right honourable friend join me in congratulating... Sir David Amos was the MP for South End West and respected throughout politics. He'd been an Essex MP, first in Basildon and then in South End since 1983. His constituency surgery at Belfair's Methodist Church had started at 10 this morning. At 12.05, police were called to reports of a stabbing. They arrived within minutes and police officers and then ambulance paramedics battled to save the MP's life. At 3 p.m., police said a man had died, confirming later that it was Sir David Amos MP. The air ambulance sent to the scene was never used. Police arrested a 25-year-old man on suspicion of murder. He's a British citizen, understood to be of apparently Somali origin. 
Detectives said he was detained shortly after officers arrived and a knife was recovered at the scene. Quickly, it became a terrorism inquiry. The investigation is in its very early stages and is being led by officers from the Specialist Counterterrorism Command. We made it clear at the time of the incident that we did not believe there was any immediate further threat to anyone else in the area. It will be for investigators to determine whether or not this is a terrorist incident. Sir David was a committed Roman Catholic and tonight at a specially arranged mass in the Catholic Church just down the road, they were paying tribute to a highly respected politician murdered while meeting the people he served. Daniel Sanford, BBC News, Leon C. Well, the numerous tributes paid today to Sir David Amos have come from right across the political spectrum. And his death has led to renewed questions about the safety of MPs five years after the murder of Joe Cox. Today, her sister, the MP Kim Leadbeater, described her horror at today's events. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. An officer's task in Essex to lower the flag. At half-mast over Parliament too. The Union Jack hanging limply and sombre over number 10, matching the mood. David was a man who believed passionately in this country and in its future. And we've, we've lost today a fine public servant and a much loved friend and colleague. And our thoughts are very much today with uh, his wife, uh, his children and, and his family. Sir David spent nearly 40 years on those green benches. David Amos! Will my right honourable friend tell one of his ministers to organise a city status <laughs> competition <laughs> so at long last South End on Sea can yeah. become a city? Yeah. Affable, indefatigable, joyous in his love of his part of the world, passionate in his causes. And all politicians have opponents, but he did not have enemies. Today is a dark, and a, and a shocking day, the more so because, heartbreakingly, we've been here before. Informed by his faith, Sir David had a profound sense of public duty, and he was highly respected and much liked across the Houses of Parliament on all sides. And yet his name's known tonight for the worst of reasons. The second MP in five years, killed just doing their job. Joe Cox, like Sir David, elected to Parliament, but a parent, a partner, and a sister too. Kim Leadbeater led her family's tributes back then. She will live on through all the good people in the world. Paying the ultimate tribute now, following Joe as their hometown MP. It's really important that we get good people in public life, but this is the risk that we're all taking. You know, and, and so many MPs today will be scared by this. And my partner came home and said, I don't want you to do it anymore. I don't, because the next time that phone goes, it could be a different conversation. This is a terrible and rare event. But the awful truth has become routine for many MPs and often their staff to face threats, intimidation and abuse. Common for those concerns to be reported to the police. And those who come to serve us in this place know full well their work can put them in harm's way. But friends say he would not want a change in the system. A proud Tory Essex man who made his way up through the 80s, who wanted to be with the people he represented. David, of all people, would not have wanted this to result in MPs withdrawing further from the public doing stuff by Zoom instead of face-to-face, -face, having screens, whatever it might be. That would have been the very last thing that David Amos would ever have wanted. And he's been one of those constant friends who've always been around, always been cheering the place up. Can't somehow uh, imagine life without them. Yet he was aware of the worst thing that could come to pass. So David wrote about an attack on another MP and warned it could happen to any one of us. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. 
Well, let's return to Leon C and join our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Sanford. Daniel, just bring us up to date with the latest on the investigation. Well, Scotland Yard's Counterterrorism Command's only been in charge of this investigation for a few hours, but already they'll be bringing their huge resources, experience and expertise to bear. Uh, they'll be queuing up huge amounts of physical evidence, CCTV evidence, phone evidence, computer evidence. The resources they bring really are quite enormous compared to a normal investigation and of course they'll also be liaising with the intelligence service the security service mi5 to try and build up a background of the suspect that's in custody and also any associates so there is a very very large-scale investigation underway underway tonight but here in leon c people are thinking about the sir david that's been their mp for all those years um, and at, a, at the church to, uh, down the road tonight, the Catholic Church, my colleague Sarah Campbell has been talking to people about the Sir David that they knew. A time to come together and remember. St Peter's Catholic Church is a few minutes' walk from where Sir David Amos was killed. What happened to Sir David today? What can we say, dear friends? But he died doing the thing he loved, meeting his constituents, his local people. We could rely on him to listen to us and to take our ideas forward. Renowned as a hard-working MP, his constituents paid their own tributes. A guy who champions everyone's cause the weak, a real true, true gentleman, and uh, we'll miss him. It is to his testament that so many of us want to give that nod and that heartfelt thanks for the way that he served this town and the people in it. Thank God for his life and thank God for that great gift. Listening to his constituents who, one after the other, have shared their memories of Sir David, it's clear that he was well loved here and will be greatly missed. You would never see David without a big smile on his face. It's a huge loss. Yeah, it is. It's massive. Yeah. Massive. massive. Massive loss. Yeah. He was a good listener. He felt, but well, people felt he represented them in the Houses of Parliament. His heart was in his community. He really was. He was the best constituency MP you could ever wish for. This is a community in shock mourning an MP who died in service to his constituents. Sarah Campbell, BBC News, Lee on Sea. Let's rejoin Laura Koonsberg at Westminster. Laura, a sense of shock right across Westminster. That is clear tonight and concern over the safety of MPs. Now the Home Secretary has ordered a review into security. That's right, Clive. It's inevitable in the coming days there will be a public conversation about the safety of MPs. That's already underway with the Home Secretary asking police forces to crack down, to do everything they can. They'll be contacting every MP in the next 24 hours. It's inevitable too, I think, there'll be another public conversation about whether some of the poison that's crept into corners of political debate in this country in the last few years is something that can be taken away. Can people in politics in real life and online learn again perhaps to be kinder to keep cooler heads to think more carefully before resorting to insult or hurling abuse or putting the kinds of threats to MPs that sadly many of them do face on a very regular basis but I have to say given this is all an agonizing echo of what happened five years ago with Joe Cox there's inevitability about those conversations happening there's nothing inevitable at all about anything changing and what the vast majority of MPs will not want to change is that precious relationship between them and their constituents. You know, it's not common in countries around the world to have what we have in this country, where MPs don't expect to be always behind the secure gates in Parliament. They expect to be out and about with members of their constituency, meeting people, yes, who voted for them, and also meeting and 
trying to help people who didn't put their box in their ballot actually supporting them. That is a very precious commodity that we have as part of our democracy and it is not something that MPs want to give up at all, even though sadly the reality is for many of them, part of the experience of what most of them see as a privileged and important job of being an MP comes with sometimes that nagging question about their own safety and their own security. But it's something that we've heard from friends of David Amos tonight that he would absolutely not want to be lost. That sense of connection between those people who stand up in the chamber and those people who sent them there to make their voice heard. OK, Laura, thank you. Laura Koonsberg there at Westminster. It's emerged that tens of thousands of people who had PCR tests in September and October were incorrectly told they didn't have coronavirus. Operations have been suspended at a private lab in Wolverhampton after more than 40,000 positive lateral flow tests were later incorrectly recorded as negative PCR results. Most of the affected cases are in the southwest of England, with some in the southeast and Wales. Here's our health editor, Hugh Pym. These are the lateral flow tests that we took. Graham has the lateral flow test results, which suggested there was COVID in his household, except that the PCR tests, which they then had done, told a different story, negative. Friends had similar experiences. Now he realises he probably did have the virus. I coach football. I carried on with that. Um, and went about everything as I normally would um, because I was convinced I just had a cold. I feel terrible. Um, my wife took extra precautions as a teacher, but I know she's upset that she may have taken the virus into school. The problems have been traced to a private laboratory on a science park in Wolverhampton. Around 43,000 PCR tests processed there from September the 8th are thought to have given false negative results. Work at the lab has been suspended. Suspicions had been raised in recent weeks, including tweets by this academic. He says the consequences are potentially serious. Tens of thousands of people have been given false negative results, thinking they maybe don't have COVID, even though they've had symptoms and a positive lateral flow device. They've been going to school, they've been going to work and potentially infecting other people. Public health leaders say after they were alerted, they needed time to work out which lab might be at fault. Why could you have not intervened sooner? We have been looking over that time period and we do listen and in fact we welcome feedback. I want to make sure that if there are any further problems with other laboratories, we can absolutely spot them as quickly as possible. So I'll be conducting um, a serious incident investigation within the Health Security Agency. The latest revelations come at a time of rising COVID cases, highlighted by the latest Office for National Statistics release on community infections. The ONS survey suggests that last week just over one million people in the UK had the virus, the highest since January, and that was largely driven by infections amongst children. But whereas case rates went up in England and Wales, they fell back in Scotland and were little changed in Northern Ireland. The vaccine means that although we have the same number of cases of January, we're not going to see anywhere near the same number of deaths or the same number of admissions. That said, we're still seeing a significant number of admissions, over 700 a day. We're still seeing over 100 deaths a day. More cases means more work for the test and trace system. In the wake of news about faulty results, officials argue it was an isolated problem and the public should have faith in the testing and lab network. Hugh Pym, BBC News. And the government's latest coronavirus figures show there were 43,489 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. That means, on average, there were 40,149 cases per day in the past week. 7,086 people were in hospital with COVID as of yesterday. Another 145 deaths have been recorded. That's of people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID test, which means, on average, there were 117 deaths per day in the past week. Of vaccinations, 85.8% of the population aged 12 and over have had their first dose, and 78.8% have been double jabbed. The government is planning to temporarily relax the rules around the number of deliveries foreign lorry drivers can make. Ministers say the measures will ease pressure on supply chains, particularly in the run-up to Christmas. But there's been some criticism from UK hauliers who've warned that British operators could be undercut. Here's our business editor, Simon Jack. Through Dover alone, nearly 3,000 lorries arrive from the EU every day. 
Before Brexit, EU drivers were free to pick up work while here in the UK. That changed in January. Facing supply chain problems, the government offered three-month visas for 5,000 drivers. Only 20 applied. So now the government plans to let foreign drivers do more deliveries while they're on UK soil. Since Brexit, EU drivers arriving here in the UK are allowed to do two domestic UK delivery jobs in the one week they're allowed to stay. Under this proposal, they could do an unlimited number of jobs in an extended two-week period in a scheme that would last for six months. And the industry estimates that means tens of thousands of UK delivery jobs would be done by lower paid and therefore lower priced EU hauliers. UK firms say that will undercut companies here who have had to offer UK drivers wage hikes of 20% plus to attract and retain staff. Fuel duty is a lot lower in EU countries to what it is in the UK. The driver in the seat in their country will be cheaper. Foreign hauliers coming into this country to do our work will most definitely cut our rates. What then happens is, is big companies then decide that that is the going rate and they give you a choice as a business. You either do it for that or you don't do it at all. Resorting to using foreign labour seems to many in the industry at odds with what the Prime Minister said last week. The answer to the present stresses and strains, which are mainly a function of growth and economic revival, is not to reach for that same old lever of uncontrolled immigration. This morning, the Transport Secretary argued it was not uncontrolled and made pragmatic sense. Having some additional capacity right now, I think everybody agrees, is a, is a good idea. This is a quick way of doing it. It doesn't require visas um, to do. People are already here. Um, so it's just a common sense measure uh, at these times. As I say, it's, it's one of very many things. Many things that include 800 short-term visas for butchers where the exit of EU workers has led to labour shortages in the pork industry. Supply chains are stressed around the world. Reaching for EU labour was not part of the post-Brexit script, but the government also knows a supply chain that can't deliver would be a very unattractive political Christmas present. Simon Jack, BBC News. Let's take a look at some of the day's other top stories now. And from the 24th of October, anyone who's fully vaccinated will be able to use a lateral flow test rather than a more expensive PCR test to prove their COVID status when travelling. It comes as the United States says it's reopening its borders to fully vaccinated travellers from the 8th of November. The Queen has been overheard expressing frustration at world leaders in action on climate change, saying she's irritated by people who talk but don't do. Her remarks were picked up on a microphone during conversations at yesterday's opening of the Welsh Parliament, the Senate, in Cardiff. The Queen is due to attend the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow next month. A leading huntsman has been found guilty of offering advice on how to hold illegal fox hunts. Mark Hankinson, a director of the Masters of Foxhounds Association, took part in online seminars where he described how to disguise fox hunts as trail hunts. Hankinson was fined £3,500, including damages and costs. Now, more than 30 people have been killed in Afghanistan in a series of explosions at a mosque in the southern city of Kandahar. Those who died are Shia Muslims who'd gathered for Friday prayers. It comes a week after a suicide attack on another Shia mosque in the northern city of Kunduz that killed at least 50 people. Our correspondent, Yogit Elimai, has the very latest. Pain and suffering is relentless in Afghanistan. This was the second major attack in a week. Both targeted at the minority Shia community. At this mosque in Kandahar, witnesses say there were three suicide bombers. The firing started after we ended prayers. Then two or three explosions took place. We were thrown towards the windows. Many people were dead and wounded. I don't know what happened later. Last Friday, the northern city of Kunduz was engulfed in terror. ISK, the regional affiliate of the Islamic State group, claimed it was behind the bombing that killed scores of people. The attacks have spread fear among the Shia minority. I couldn't stop crying after seeing the news from Kandahar, said this woman. We Shias have long been oppressed and every time we're targeted. In recent weeks, ISK has carried out dozens of attacks, some against Taliban fighters. 
This is the biggest challenge to the Taliban's hold on security in this country since they seized power in August. They've said they don't want the US or any foreign country to be involved in operations against IS. But with an increasing number of such attacks, questions are being raised about their ability to combat the threat. Taliban leaders have been playing down the dangers of IS. Desperate to portray, they've brought stability and peace to Afghanistan. The latest attack on their stronghold Kandahar exposes the cracks in their claims. Yogi Talamai, BBC News, Kabul. Here, shoppers can now make contactless payments of £100 per transaction, raising the limit from £45. Retailers are, however, warning that it could take months to update their terminals and there are also concerns about the risk of fraud. Now, it's been a wait of six years for fans of the singer Adele, but now one of the biggest selling artists of the 21st century has released a new single entitled Easy On Me. She says it's an attempt to explain her divorce to her son. Her new album, 30, comes out next month. Our music correspondent, Mark Savage, has more. There ain't no gold in this and when I was singing it, you know, for the recording and stuff like that, but there's just there's an element of hope in it, which in turn gave me hope, you know, because I was at my wits' ends, you know, in the beginning of 2019. We heard that she'd broken up. You think, oh, there are going to be, inevitably, as sad as it is, for everybody concerned, there are going to be some really good songs um, coming out of the pain that she's been through. And, you know, I really admire the honesty um, for her to talk about so openly what has happened and all the feelings that she's had. Adele's new record comes with big expectations. She already has 15 Grammys, one Oscar and nine Brit Awards. And she's inspired a new generation of artists, including fellow Brit nominee Joy Crooks. I think the thing that Adele made me feel OK with is that I'm not afraid of ballads. I know that in my past, I've had friends when I was younger be like, why are you writing these kinds of songs? And I remember feeling a bit ashamed of my writing. And then the second thing is, amidst all her success, all of the things that could have changed her accolades, everything, she's just so real. Oh well, yeah, maybe, keep trying though. You know, the other one was like, I'm busy working. So that was the perfect um, response for me. <laughs> Mark Savage, BBC News. Let's return now to our main story, the killing of the Conservative MP Sir David Amos at his constituency surgery in Leon C in Essex. Our home editor Mark Easton is here. Mark, Sir David, he was simply carrying out his duty as an MP, um, meeting his constituents to hear their problems, their concerns. It is a fundamental feature of British democracy and today that came under attack. I, I think you're right. This, you know, this is the violent and shocking death of a respected public servant. But it is also, as you say, an attack on public service itself, our democracy, our values, because the British way of life is sustained by men and women who devote themselves to representing the interests of others. For MPs, their relationship with their constituents is at the heart of what they are about. And that means they've got to be accessible. They must be able to listen. They must be able to engage. And, and, and Sir David, of course, famously had a reputation for doing just that. But his death emphasises the very real risks. In the last few years, police have recorded hundreds of crimes against MPs, hate mail, harassment, death threats, and some physical assaults. Now, the Home Secretary, as we've been hearing, is asking the police to review the security arrangements around MPs. And of course, there are going to be discussions about how we can better protect our public representatives. But very, very few politicians will want this awful crime to undermine in any way the connection between them and the people they serve. And you will know a person who would be as worried as anybody about that potential outcome. Sir David Amos. Indeed. OK. Mark, thank you. Mark Easton there. That's it. On Newsnight Now, a special programme looking at today's events and the issues around MP safety. But now on BBC One, time for the news where you are. Have a very good night.